Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure of discussing with you anatomical terminology. And it's not just anatomical terminology, but really I want to get into a conversation about, if you think about it, it's very important that we all have a common reference point when we're talking about anatomy. And we need to know directions in terms of left and right. And I know that seems obvious. We need to know what is up and what is down. And we should also get into a conversation about various planes that are able to, to slice the body up so we can re refer to certain regions of the body most accurately. And this is important for a, a number of reasons. It's important because the truth is when you're looking at imaging techniques, if you're looking at uh, MRI or CAT scans or any sort of x-rays, you need to be able to reference where you are. And so it's kind of like a map kind of a conversation. And so I hope you enjoy this. I hope you find it interesting. Again, anatomy, uh, I think you're familiar with it. Again, it, it's coming from the Greek meaning to cut up. And just that suffix, uh, uh, like uh, anatomy to me, uh, you may be familiar with, uh, this is a, something that's commonly used in the medical terminology, like for example, a, a tonsillectomy to remove or cutting out the tonsils, for example. That's, that, that's what we're talking about. And then again, just a few things uh, of review. You may be familiar with gross anatomy or things that you could see uh, without any aids, in other words, microscopes or anything like that. So large structures. Now, normally medical students or nursing students will find themselves working with, with cadavers, like physically examining structures through a dissection. But lately, uh, students have the, uh, I, I think it's pretty cool, have the ability to look at uh, digital imagery of cadavers. And you can tap on different structures and look at them. Um, and they're labeled and it even pronounces the names of the structures. It's pretty good. But I'll, I'll say this, as awesome as, and I love technology personally, as awesome as this is, you do ultimately want to work with a real uh, cadaver because that's, you know, patients are often real and not virtual. Uh, we have instruments such as the light microscope, which is very useful that you could study uh, microscopic anatomy. So it's not just gross anatomy, it's microscopic anatomy. And let me give me an example of that. Like you may or may not recognize this particular groupings of cells called a tissue, but this is found in your trachea. This is something called pseudo stratified because it sort of looks stratified, but it's not pseudo stratified. And the cells are shaped as sort of columns. So it's columnar. And, and it's ciliated. These are protein-like extensions that move and help to capture dust particles in the trachea. And this is the, this is the lumen up here. And so microscopes are really important, especially the light microscope. We work with it often. But then there's this microscope, which is really powerful. It's an electron microscope. And in particular, there's different kinds. This one is called the scanning electron microscope, or SEM. This could look at, at the same structure, in other words, the trachea, which is your windpipe right here in the front of your neck, interior, we'll get to that. Uh, the, these are the same cells and these are 3D uh, looking at the surface. So the scanning electron microscope can do 3D and surface. So here we are looking down at the cilia, sort of looks like carpet that can sway back and forth and help to move dust particles out. Again, this is a, a, another type of electron microscope that can be used in anatomy. And this is called transmission, and it's very powerful. It can actually look into one particular cell, and you can then look at the anatomy of a cell. You can look at the nucleus and the mitochondria and the various uh, substructures like a Golgi apparatus, a lysosome, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, these sorts of things. However, <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> things that you could touch and feel. So the term palpate is to touch and, and nurses and physicians like to use their hands in order to feel certain structures in the patient's body. And when you can feel something very easily, it uh, allows you to know exactly where you are, or where things are. And so, for example, you might be familiar with this bone, which is sometimes known as the breastbone or sternum. It's, uh, it's a landmark, and so we, you can look at surface anatomy. In other words, things that you can touch and feel on the surface. So 
the sternum is made up of, of three distinctive regions. You have this shield-like area right here, and I can sort of touch mine. You can see this notch right here. You can feel the top of the sternum, and this is known as the manubrium or shield. And then where it articulates or connects to this structure right here is known as the body. And then this sort of sword-like structure at the very bottom is xiphoid process. So a sword-like process that, that extends. And, and what, I, what I'm getting at with this is that you could feel on a patient very easily right in here where the manubrium uh, connects to the body. And that's known as the, the sternal angle of Lewis, right in here where I'm pointing with the cursor. And if you know where that is, you'll know that that point right there uh, is where, where it connects to the costal cartilage. In other words, the rib cartilage or ultimately the, the ribs. The first one goes here, the second one goes here. You know that that's the top of the heart of the patient because you can feel that or palpate that. So that, that's pretty cool. And again, same thing, but a, just a, a backup image. You can sort of see these uh, anatomical landmarks. You can see the manubrium right there and then where it connects to the bottom, the body is the sternal angle. And so you can see here's the first and, se and second uh, cartilage. And therefore, this is the top of the heart right there. And so another one sort of towards the back or posterior, this is obviously your uh, vertebral column. These are the cerv cervical uh, bones of, of the back of your neck. And these structures that are sort of protruding outward are uh, uh, spine, spinous processes right in here. And so this is, if I count down, this is the cervical one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh vertebrae, cervical uh, vertebrae known as C7, has this really long sinus process. And, and when you're feeling on a patient, you can really feel that uh, pretty easily. And then if you count just two bumps below that, that's also the top of the heart. If you wanted to listen to the heart with a stethoscope, for example, listen to heartbeat, that's a good way of doing it. So that all of that is, is kind of just a warm up to where I really want, this is the heart and soul of everything that I wanna to say today. This is the, the come away message. You really need uh, as a medical profession, you really need to know uh, a reference point. You need to know where you are, what is left, what is right, what is going on. And so this is known as, and you may be familiar with this already, this is known as anatomical position. And the most important thing about anatomical position is that it's based on the patient. It's based on the subject. So it's not you, it's the patient that we're talking about. So if you could see here, I'll see if I can mark this. This is the patient's right side, and this is the patient's left side. It's based on the subject, and that's most important, anatomical position. And so it's a point of reference that everything is based on. And so you're standing up, you're facing forward, your eyes are facing forward, your palms are face downward, and you can determine uh, this is the right side and this is the left side based on anatomical position. So if you're following this, you'll, you'll realize that what you're dealing with over here, if I can get my, my cursor to, to come back, uh, here I am up there. I don't know why that's not happening. Let me go back. But uh, you can see that over here, there we go. Sorry about that. This is the right side of the patient. So this is the right side of the heart, and this is the left side of the heart. And that's, a, that's pretty crucial. So again, if you look at the internal anatomy, of the heart. You can see over here, and this isn't a, a, the video about the heart, but it's it's about knowing uh, directions and orientation when you're discussing anatomical terms. For example, this is the right side of the heart. This is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle. This would be the left atrium and left ventricle. And you can appreciate the importance of that. Now, a lot of the terms that, that are going to come our way in anatomy and physiology are, have their origins in Latin and Greek. And so just a couple of examples of that, uh, it's kind of fun uh, if you ask me, like where do you, when you're looking at these muscles right here, um, uh, you can see that what you're dealing with is a, a, a pair of muscles called the rectus abdominis. And so rectus means straight. And so these muscles are parallel and they're also found in the abdominal area of the body, which is below the diaphragm, not in the thoracic area, which is above. And so this rectus abdominis, uh, abdominis is parallel, as I said, uh, muscles that are, that are coming in this direction and in this direction. And they're separated uh, by a, a piece of uh, connective tissue known as the 
uh, linea alba. So linea means a line and alba means white. And so you're looking at a white line that separates the rectus abdominis on each side. Now you can get into uh, uh, quadrants and you can look at different uh, uh, divisions of the body. And so you, you know, this may make obvious sense to you, but you can see here is the right upper quadrant. If you divide the, the uh, abdominal area into four parts, so it's quads. So here's the right upper quadrant. This would be the the right lower quadrant, the left upper quad quadrant, etc. You can divide the body up this way. Another common way of doing this is to make a straight line through the body, and it's called obviously the midline. And this is very important, the midline, because what comes of this is the concepts of lateral and medial, which are very important in anatomical terminology. Lateral, or from the Latin mean lateris meaning to the side so it refers to the side of a person so lateral to the side so you have a left side and a right side so for example if this is your right knee and again this is the patient's right knee over on the on the side would be the lateral side so this is over here this let's look at this knee joint for a second where the femur articulates with the tibia there's these C-shaped rings of cartilage that sit in here called the meniscus or menisci for plural. This is the lateral meniscus and toward the middle of the of the body is the medial meniscus and so it's really important. Like for example medius or middle refers to structures that are closer or to the middle median plane. So it's at midline. So this is the inside area and this is the outer part lateral and medial. And so you can see that again right over here. And so one way to consider it is if A is medial to B, so if A is medial to B, then B must be uh, lateral to A. And that, I hope that makes sense to you. And so there, there again is that midline. So another example of this, the heart, which is located right in the center right in here, the heart is medial to the lungs, which are lateral on both sides, more towards the side. The heart, again, in the center is close to the midline, so it's medial. The kidneys uh, are located uh, lateral, meaning, meaning to the side of the spine. So but there's two sets of kidneys and they're both lateral to the spine. Hopefully that, that was clear. And so I'm gonna keep coming back to this particular directional, and that's what we're talking about, directional references. So medial is close to the midline and lateral is to the side. So this is the right knee that I was talking about. This was the, the medial meniscus, and this is the lateral meniscus of, of the right knee. So we have these terms that are also very important, anterior uh, toward the front and posterior towards the back. So anterior toward the front of the body or in front of, and posterior uh, toward the back. And so I always like to remember posterior so it sort of sounds like posture. So it's, it has to do with your back. And so your rectum is, which is connecting to the anus, is posterior to the urinary bladder, which is anterior, okay? Uh, another example would be, like for example, if you look here, your trachea, what I was referring to earlier with the ciliated columnar right in here, the cilia is anterior to the esophagus, which is your part of your alimentary canal where food is traveling down. So anterior and posterior. Trachea is anterior to the esophagus. Okay. Now, some more of these directional terms. Superior. Superior doesn't mean like better than, but it does mean on top of or toward, toward the head or upper and above structure. So superior versus inferior, meaning uh, lower, a lower body stru structure or below. So these are important. So superior and inferior. So getting back to the heart again, we have uh, major blood vessels that are taking blood into the heart. And blood is received over here from the head in the right atrium. So this is the right side of the heart in a structure called the superior vena cava. So it's coming from above as opposed to this blood vessel right here, that, which is bringing blood toward the heart. Both vessels that bring uh, 
blood toward the heart or, or veins. So this vein right here is the inferior because it's coming from below. It's the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, which are dumping into the right side of the heart. And so coming back to our sternum over here, and here's the manubrium, uh, here's our body and xiphoid process. So check this out. The xiphoid process is inferior to the body and the manubrium is superior to the body. How about that? Okay. And so in addition to uh, superior and inferior and lateral and meter, medial, we have proximal, meaning nearest. And so do you see proximal is closest to the or nearest to the body and distal means further away from the body, okay? And so, for example, the shoulder is proximal to the wrist, okay? Uh, more examples of this. Distal, again, Latin, meaning distar, meaning to stand away from something. Okay, let's take a look at this. So you might recognize this as being uh, bones of the hand. Here's the wrist. Uh, here, here's your, uh, uh, your lo uh, lower arm bones right over here. And so these terms proximal and distal describe parts that are close or distant from the main mass of the body. Um, for example, uh, uh, for these phalanges right here are distal to the metacarpals, which are right here. Now the metacarpals are distal to the carpals. <laughs> these, are, these are proximal. The carpals are proximal, closer to the midpoint of the body. Uh, likewise, it's taken into the whole arm and, and shoulder into consideration. The scapula uh, is proximal to the humerus, which is right here, which is distal, meaning further away. Uh, the wrist is distal to the elbow, which is proximal. Okay, so now we're starting to accumulate these terms. Hopefully this is this is making sense and it's and it's enjoyable in some way. So we have proximal, closest to the core of the body, distal meaning away. Um, we have medial towards the midline, lateral away. We have superior coming from the head and inferior, okay? And we can also look at, at anterior and posterior. Now, these terms, I, d I don't wanna just ignore them. Cranial uh, or towards the head or caudal, meaning towards the tail. In this case, you know, humans, <laughs> it doesn't so much apply, although we do have a tailbone, but it's uh, cranial towards the head or caudal towards the, towards the tail. And so again, more diagrams. You feel free to pause the video and just take a look at this. Uh, I don't want to necessarily read all those terms, but it's a nice review of what we've been talking about. Su superior, inferior, we have the uh, anterior, uh, and posterior. Sometimes interior depends. If you're not talking about humans, you're talking about animals and uh, veterinarian medicine, for example, sometimes it's referred to as ventral side and dorsal. You might be familiar with, like for example, the shark dorsal fin, uh, that sort of thing. And again, fish for caudal. Now in anatomy, we can also talk about superficial or external or deep or internal. These are again reference points. Superficial meaning sort of external towards the body surface and uh, deep meaning internal or uh, from the body surface. So here it's usually referred to when, when things are in layers, like for example, the skin. Um, epidermis is more superficial uh, to the hypodermis or subcutaneous it's sometimes referred to. Uh, this particular type of tissue that's yellow is adipose. That would be more deep or internal, and this would be more superficial. So you can have a superficial wound or an internal uh, wound, if, you, if that's what you're, you're, you're uh, discussing. Now, sectional anatomies are very important because this is when you're starting to talk about sort of these radiological techniques like MRI or PET scans or CT scans. You need to understand a little bit about how the body could be sliced in terms of uh, planes and sections. And so a plane, just to make sure that we, we all understand what we're talking about, a plane is a three-dimensional axis and the section is a slice parallel to that plane. Okay, so that may or may not uh, make sense, but we'll look at some of these things. And, and again, we use this to visualize the internal organiz 
organization of, of structures. And so this might be familiar to you already, but we have something, this plane, this is what I meant by a plane, is a coronal plane. And, it, and it, it's able to create, when you cut the body like this, you're able to create the interior towards the front and the posterior in the back. A coronal plane can do that. It creates front and back. Okay, so coronal plane, very important. The, like for example, if you're studying, uh, and again, ignore those other ones, but this sort of uh, frontal plane is also the coronal plane. So here it is. It creates the front part of the brain and the back part of the brain. Okay, so it creates, again, something ventral or something dorsal or something belly, meaning towards the front or back, uh, or anterior and posterior. So frontal plane is able to do that. Now, this coronal plane, again, uh, is uh, dividing the body in half. And this is sort of what I was just saying a moment ago, but it's written out here. It does create anterior and posterior. And it's sort of an imaginary line that sort of cuts through both shoulders like that. And, and, and coronal or frontal plane, same thing. Okay. And, and if you, when you're considering this coronal plane, I wanted to bring up two important words that will be important in anatomy and physiology, which is abduct and adduct. And these are terms where we're starting to talk about the movement of limbs. And when we start talking about abduction and adduction, what we're doing is we're discussing that movement in relative to this coronal plane. So to abduct, and, and again, sort of like an abduction, you're, you're like taking something away. So it pulls the structure away from the midline of the body. So if you're lifting your arms up like this, then you're, it, it's, a, it's re referred to as an abduction. Whereas adduct, meaning a motion that pulls a structure toward the midline of the body along the coronal plane. Okay. Now we have a different plane. It's called the sagittal plane. Now the sagittal plane or uh, median plane cuts the body right through and so it creates sides this is what creates the right side of the body uh, over here and this is the left side of the body over here the sagittal cut again that's important uh, and so this the coronal plane is an example of a longitudinal cut getting back to that and because it's perpendicular to this third type of plane which is the transverse so cutting right across like this, transverse. Now you can imagine that transverse uh, plane can happen in many areas. And so you can just slice the body up transverse like this. Now you might be familiar with transverse. It's, to me, it's one of the most common ones because when you cut something like, let's just move away from the body for a second. Say you're working with uh, a cucumber and you're slicing it up, you're making some cuts. So you're making transverse cuts or cross-sectional cuts and they look like that. And so that's important when you're looking at imaging that, that you know you're looking at a cross section or a transverse plane. They're horizontal, okay, going side to side. It creates a top and a bottom, a transverse plane does, obviously, or not. Now, this is important. Uh, a CT scan, um, you know, looking at this tomography, and, and again, you're, you're, you're cutting and you're looking at uh, using x rays. And you're putting the patient in here, and what it what it does is it's using X-rays to take pictures from different angles uh, in virtual slices. So you're creating these cross sections of, of of the person. So you can look at many of them, and, and you can look up at the screen and check this out. Uh, it's pretty interesting, but it's important to know that. So the the radiologist needs to know their their plans. It's also important in the study of tissues. Do you remember that tissues is the study of histology? So if you're looking at some, I don't know if you recognize what this tissue is, but this is muscle. So if you're looking at it and you're like, well, how can this and this be the same thing? And the light microscope, this is a cross section of muscle. Okay. And this is a longitudinal section. So in other words, you're cutting a cross section or you're cutting a longitudinal section. And you have to be aware of that in terms of making an analysis if you're trying to look at this. And again, this is a, a longitudinal cut of what to me looks like uh, skeletal muscle because I'm seeing striations, it's multinucleated. So again, we may be from more familiar, like again, back to the cucumber, you can cut it this way, you're, you're making a longitudinal cut, okay? 
And so again, back to this, uh, carrots, you can cut them transverse, bup, 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 like that, and you can create many cross sections. So this is cross-sectional view of muscle. All right, and so again, uh, the important when you're, you're looking at these planes, here's your frontal plane, here's your sagittal plane, and your transverse or sometimes known as horizontal plane right there. There's your, your transverse plane, okay? Uh, so say we're slicing the brain up. Here's the coronal plane, so you're creating a front and a back. Here's your transverse or horizontal plane, and then your uh, sagittal cut. Now, if you cut sagittal, you can cut it here or here or here, but if you cut it right in the middle, it's referred to especially mid-sagittal plane. And again, here is, we were just discussing that, here's the mid-sagittal cut. So uh, if you ever find yourself doing a dissection of the brain, you can look at a mid-sagittal uh, cut. You could, again, look at the transverse cut. It's informative. Or you can look at frontal cut right there. And uh, why would this be important? Again, I mentioned this. It, like, for example, if you're studying uh, MRI images, and again, this would be of the head, which is kind of a, an important uh, structure to know what you're looking at. So it's this, this is not an x-ray, just saying that these are the use of mag a magnetic field. And, and if you're familiar with this, it, it makes a pretty loud noise if you've ever had an MRI, and it takes about 45 minutes. But again, this is an image of the brain, sagittal cut, and this is a coronal cut. You can make many slices, uh, many horizontal or transverse cuts or, uh, and many coronal cuts. And you can take a look and see what's happening inside the brain if there's some damage. Okay, so hopefully that was uh, informative and I hope you enjoyed it. It's a brief look at anatomical terminolo <laughs> excuse me, anatomical terminology and planes and uh, reference points and landmarks in terms of anatomy and physiology. Thanks for watching.